going on. Okay, so as Mark said, I'm Susan Porter. I'm the archaeologist for Mole Basingstoke. And Milton Heights was our first site that we did out of the office. So just to orient where you are, Milton Heights, we are just up the A34 in Oxfordshire. Off the, it's off the Milton Interchange Junction. We are just up there. So what we did on site was this enormous area that you can see here. And this part is a, a, um, a plateaued area. So it's a very flat area just here. And past the hedge line that you can see separating the areas here, everything drops off down a slope. So this was a commercial development that we got involved in with the project funded by Red Row Homes. They are still providing funding to us because we're still working on the write up for the site. We found an awful lot of um, information here and we're still processing it all. So it's much thanks to Red Row for keeping us on doing it. Phoenix Consulting provided an archeological overview for what was going on and undertook monitoring meetings for us. And we are Mola, we under the, undertook the excavation work. So it's commercial excavation ahead of a housing development. that I believe they may have finished putting the houses on now. We did this in 2017, so it's a couple of years ago now, and we're still working on our write-up. And because I'll be referring to different areas when I'm talking you through the site, I'll just give you a quick look. This is our area one. Area two is the one that I'll be talking about mostly, which is this big one here on the plateau. Area three, we found nothing in, that's over here area four, area five down at the bottom, and area six over here. Most of what I'll be talking about will be in the area two just up here, but I might drop down here once or twice to discuss something else. So just to keep you a, a little bit oriented on the site, that's how things are going. North is up here this way, and the A34 is just off the screen over here. So moving on then. As I said, the site's being redeveloped for residential homes. There was a geophysical survey done in early 2017, which picked up a lot of archaeology enclosures likely to be of Iron Age Romano British date. This was followed up as is usual for commercial um, development with evaluation trenching to check the accuracy of the geophys. What they found was that there was more archaeology on site than the geophysics initially implied, and they thought they had a building somewhere on site. So what happened then was that we targeted the areas that I've just, just shown you in the previous shot, and we went for a targeted excavation on areas where we thought most of the archaeology was going to be and we would get most of our information. Me and my team were on site for 18 weeks in total. We started in glorious, beautiful sunshine in August, and we finished up shoveling all this snow off site in the last week before Christmas, desperately trying to finish it. Uh, my team look very happy in this picture. I can assure you they were not happy on that day until I bought them all coffee and bribed them to continue digging. We couldn't see anything, but we got it done. We got it finished. We were wrapped up before Christmas and we answered almost all of our questions until we got into post X. So moving on then. I will, um, my plan for today is to just basically run you through a brief history of the site from start to finish and what we think was going on. We still have a lot of unanswered questions, but hopefully I can give you an overview of roughly what we found there in some sort of coherent storyline. In terms of prehistoric activity, we didn't find very much at all. We had no in situ finds whatsoever, but we did get 44 shards of flint. That was it for the entire site. But it is enough for the Mesolithic period, certainly, for us to um, think that people were undertaking organised flint napping on the site. So they were passing through, but certainly stopping, sitting down, napping flint and moving on. But we have no indication of any temporary camps, settlements or even trackways that they were using. We just know that people were progressing through the landscape. The Neolithic Fabricator, which is the, the picture here, is the only piece of Neolithic flint that we got. Everything else was mes Mesolithic. But unfortunately, this wasn't in situ either. We found it in the base of a substantial Iron Age ditch. We think it ended up there through ploughing, animal movement and subsequent use of the site, which is unfortunate. It would have been really nice to have a, a Neolithic pit or something on site. But at least we know that people were passing through the area. So very, very early in its history, Milton Heights was a big open area. People passing through, potentially making camps, but we can't really say any more than that. Our first indication of real use of the site is in the Middle Bronze Age. And Milton Heights itself lies within a much wider Bronze Age landscape. We know that there's a ring ditch on Stevenson Hill and a barrow lies between Milton and Harwell. Harwell is just to the southeast of the site. So we're in an area of um, prehistoric Bronze Age activity. 
The Uffington White Horse, also a Bronze Age date, would have been known to anybody traveling through the area. It's roughly 26 miles away, I think. Yeah, 26 miles away. So people would have known about it. And um, lost my place, sorry. Yeah, the only features that we got, however, on site were cremation features. So again, we're not looking at any kind of settlement pattern. It looks very much like the landscape is still one of transition and moving through. It was seven cremations that we got. This one was an absolutely enormous one. When we sent this in for analysis, we assumed it was going to be several individuals or an animal burial because it was so big. This is a one meter scale, but it turned out it was just one individual within this cremation pit. So we were quite surprised by that. We managed to get radiocarbon dates from two of the cremations. They were all clustered together down one side of the site and they gave us a very solid Middle Iron Age, Middle Bronze Age date, sorry, Middle Bronze Age date. They gave us a very sol solid Middle Bronze Age date. And that was everything we had for the Bronze Age. We had no late Bronze Age activity whatsoever, just five shards of pottery which came out of various Roman contexts or Iron Age contexts. So we think people must have still been using the site. It would have been usual for them to have abandoned it completely, but we have no indication whatsoever of a Bronze Age settlement or any kind of use of the site at all, other than the funerary activity in the Middle Bronze Age. When we get to the Iron Age, however, things start looking a bit different. The site was definitely occupied through the early Middle and later Iron Age. We got a substantial amount of Iron Age pottery from the site and a lot of ring ditches, all of which appear to have several phases of occupation and activity. We've also got post-built structures on site. We have linear enclosures and the starts of what looks like agricultural settlement. Uh, a corn dryer and a flue, a corn dryer or a flue, we're still trying to decide on the function of this feature, which I will show you in a later slide. And we had a single inhumation burial dated to the late Iron Age. I will give you a warning when that slide comes up because I know some people aren't too happy about looking at human remains. So I will try and make sure I give you a quick warning in case you're somebody who'd prefer to look away from the screen when I, I discuss the human remains. The early Iron Age, we don't have very much going on at all. We had lots of early Iron Age pottery, but unfortunately only a few features that we could attribute to the Iron Age, the early Iron Age. And these are all up in that large area, area two, which was right up on the plateau that I showed you on the, the photograph in, in the first, Sorry, first slide. So all we had for this were isolated pits and post holes. We're hoping that when we look at some of the spatial data for the site that we might be able to pick up lines of post holes and maybe start seeing fences or buildings. But at the moment, these are the only ones that we've been able to date with any certainty to the early Iron Age. We're hoping we've got the indications of the beginning of settlement and the beginning of agricultural use of the site. But obviously, as you can see, with such a sporadic amount of, of pits and postals, we can't say anything with any concrete certainty for the early Iron Age phase of the site, just that there seems to be much more going on than there was earlier. In area five, which was right down at the very, very bottom of the site, so you had area two was right the way up, up here, area three, four and five were coming down, area five was right at the bottom end of the slope where we looked at earlier. This is potentially the earliest feature that we had on site. One of our shards of Bronze Age pottery came from the lower fill of the terminal of this ditch here. We got pottery of early Iron Age date from the upper fills. We don't think we can call the ditch Bronze Age at all. We think it is early Iron Age, but it's tempting to think that perhaps it was open a little bit longer and maybe we have a transitional late Bronze Age, early Iron Age framework just here on the slope, but we can't be certain. The Middle Iron Age looks much more concrete for what we're seeing as we've got lots and lots of settlements starting to occur. We have ring and penannula ditches, uh, ring one here, ring here, and they're all on this flat plateau area up at the top with a tiny little ditch just, just off the slope. The hedge line ran through here between these two sites, which is the crest of the hill, and everything starts dropping off down to the south this way. So all the settlement was concentrated on the top of the hill which was probably for a good reason because we noticed everything starting to flood down at this end as the weather got wetter. It was much nicer to work up here where the ground was more solid. The most interesting thing we have for this period is this cluster that seems to be going on here. All of the ring ditches had um, phases of cutting and recutting. They all had at least two phases of recut. This one appears to have been very strange indeed. We have an undated curve of ring ditch just under here. Then this middle one appeared. Then that seems to have been backfilled and this larger one came in here. At some point they reopened the line between them here and extended it this way. 
And then at some point again after that, this extra one was added on the end. And we think at the end of its duration, all three of these ditches were in use at the same time with a ring here, probably for a round house, maybe an animal enclosure here and another animal enclosure at the back here. It's a very interesting complex that appears to have dominated the site in this period. And this is it from our, our aerial drone shot from a different angle. As you can see, we, we dug a lot of slots through this. They all look, uh, they all look very nice when they're done. What we don't have is the firm evidence for the internal structures, certainly not in this one, not so much in this one. There's one or two post holes in this one, but we can't be absolutely 100% certain that they relate to the ring ditch itself. They could be an earlier or later structure, though, looking at the distribution of them, it seems likely that we probably have a roundhouse in here. The undated one is just curving around here. You can see the slots in it just there. We think it's earlier, but we got no dating material from this one. So at the moment, it counts as an undated ditch. We also had post-built structures in this period. We had several four-post structures, so that just have the little four posts like that. They're typically later Bronze Age, but these ones that we had appeared to be Iron Age. We had this one is a seven post structure. We think it's potentially an agricultural storage or maybe an animal shelter lean to with the six external post holes around here and the one internal post hole. This one, all of the posts were packed with stone and we got some nice Iron Age pottery from two of them. So we're quite confident of a middle Iron Age date for this feature. This one is a very, very strange feature. In fact, so strange, we're looking at having the pottery for this one potentially re-examined because the pottery we have from it is of middle Iron Age date, but it looks, for those of you who know what they look like, it looks very much like one of the, uh, the Saxon sunken featured buildings, although a very, very small one. This one's only one meter by two meters, which would be very small for a Saxon sunken building, but it has that traditional playing card shape with the rounded corners. We've had the pottery looked at, it came back with a middle Iron Age date. The unfortunate thing about Saxon pottery is that it tends to look a bit like Iron Age pottery when it's degraded a bit. So we're just looking for a second opinion on this one to check that maybe it's not a Saxon building. Whatever it was, whatever date it was, we think it's another form of agricultural storage um, type of structure. We have the two post holes, one at this end, one at this end, a couple of internal stake holes that maybe for a wattle work or something. And there's 14, stake holes around the edge that we think in conjunction with the two pillars formed a pitched roof across the top of it and it functioned as some kind of grain store or small animal habitat or something of the like. It's again why we want to look at it and see if we can um, see that we're clearly certain that it is of middle iron age rather than Saxon date because we don't have a comparable feature for this. We can't match it up with anything else iron age that we know of. So it's an intriguing structure for us. Um, my next slide, for those of you who didn't want to see the human remains, will be the, uh, the Iron Age skeleton that we found. Oh no, well, that's further on, sorry. So moving into the late Iron Age, we start seeing different things going on in the later Iron Age. We think the roundhouses and things continue in use, so we still have the penannula ditches, we've left them covered in. But what we're starting to see now is the growth of an enclosure system. We have a smaller one down here, a much more rectangular one up here. So another enclosure up this way. And around these, this middle complex of Iron Age buildings is a much larger, very substantial ditch has come into play just here. So if I bring this up closer for you, it was an extremely large ditch. And what we found very interesting about it was that we had an entranceway just here with posts on the inside of it. So we wondered if we're looking at some form of gated access way into the building. Now, it's arguable that perhaps the roundhouse has gone out of use by this point and that none of the, the figures shown in green here are active and occupied and in use at the same time as this larger ditch. However, there's enough of a link up between these two access points here that we can suggest that they remained in use at the same time. Our main question is, what is it? Are we looking at a chieftain's hut that's now suddenly got a huge ditch around it? Or are we looking at something a bit more like a Temple complex is a place of religious veneration where shrines were kept in here and it was gated access so that only certain people could come in. We simply don't have the evidence to answer the question. It could just as easily be a response to the, the coming of the Romans. We know the Romans moved into Oxford quite early on and the Roman military had quite a heavy presence around Oxfordshire. 
So it could simply be somebody felt a need for a defensive ditch around their, their larger hut. We're uncertain. We would like to answer this question a little more, but currently we don't have the evidence to come down with a really firm theory on this one. What we have here is uh, a corn dryer. It's only one. We're not looking at any kind of industrial processing going on on the site. This seems to just be one corn dryer associated probably with a single unit drying or processing the corn. We found a complete Roman pottery vessel and we think it was completely raised as a deliberate act based on the, the pottery vessel being there as a deliberate deposit. We found a couple of charred grains and things. It's a late Iron Age date that we have for it. So we think it's late Iron Age rather than Roman, but the pottery that came out of it was also early Roman date. That could be a result of trade more than anything else when unsure there's so much uncertainty about this site we have so many questions still to answer but um we're not looking at industry unfortunately we were hoping to find more but it is just a one-off the next slide is actually the skeleton and human remains so if you didn't want to see it please do feel free to look away from the screen at this point this is our burial so she she, she's the only identified female burial that we have on the site, and she was completely isolated within the Iron Age landscape. She's not near any of the other Iron Age features at all. She's one of the best preserved human remains that we have on site, which is interesting considering that she's the oldest, and a radiocarbon date gave us a very solid first century BC date, so she's Iron Age rather than Roman. And as you can see, the grave cut here is very, very small. She's been quite well packed into it. And what you can't see is where her left leg was because we had to remove it in order to get the photograph because, and it's a little bit gruesome, the leg joint was still in, so the hip socket was still in, but the knee was lay on the uh, on skull up here. So the leg had been twisted around within the socket. We assume, we hope that this was just to fit the, the body in the grave during interment and wasn't actually some form of terrible torment that she had to endure. We sincerely hope it wasn't. The right leg has been sawn off here and was buried underneath them. So we think it's possibly just because of the small size of the grave cut that she was perhaps buried in a bit of a rush. But as you can see, every, everything here is tightly bound around the middle. Her arms were very close up to the chest. In fact, we found her fingers inside the chest cavity. So we think she was just very, very tightly bound. We're not sure whether this is a deviant burial or not. She could be the burial of a criminal. It could simply be that they needed somewhere to bury somebody quite fast. It could be with a small, a small grave cut like this, maybe she died in the winter and having been stood out on site today digging holes, it, you're not going to dig a big hole in, a, yeah, in the middle of winter if you don't have to, the ground is solid, you can't get through it. It may simply be that she was unfortunate enough to die in the winter rather than in the summer and ended up with a small burial cut. There were no grave goods within, so we don't know anything more about her other than that she was an adult lady of Iron Age date. We'd love to know more, so we're going to start looking into, um, into other examples of burials, Iron Age burials in Oxfordshire, to see if we can find any similar examples and figure out whether that this is a special thing that's going on or whether it just is a random interment that needed to be done at that time. So we move on now into the Roman period, which is where everything seems to change. So the yellow marks on this plan, is where the Roman features come in. And as you can see, there's been a big shift in the site location being in the central area of my area too on the plateau. More over to the west, we have these huge ditches running roughly north-south, demarcating a plot of land. We have other ditches running east-west. We think what we have early on is a Roman ladder system. So the series of agricultural strips with ladders coming through. So everything's divided up. And um, everything seems to have moved over. When they did the evaluation, a trench roughly around here, they found a lot of Roman building material. There was stonework, there was ceramic building material, and the evaluation trenching was hoping that what we'd find when we came back to do the excavation was a substantial Roman building of reasonably high status. We couldn't find this building anywhere. We looked for it and we looked for it and we couldn't find anything. What we did find were these very nice tiles. Now, our ceramic um, specialists got very, very excited when they saw these because apparently these are rather high status Roman bath tiles. They're the sort of things you get in a very, very nice bathhouse. So we should have been looking for a villa site around here and we didn't find anything. 
We assume that the villa site is close by. The amount of material that we found of Roman date would certainly suggest that there is a Roman rural villa somewhere in the area. In Oxfordshire, there are a lot of Roman rural villas. They're roughly every two or three kilometres. There is another one known at the, the Harwell Physics Campus, the Diamond Light Source. They have a Roman villa was excavated a couple of years ago, just to the south of that, again, by the A34. Um, I was involved in that dig as well, actually. They found lots of stuff up there. But we couldn't figure out where on earth this bath tile could have come from. We collected quite a lot of it. We think where it must be is in the 1960s building development to the north, in which case all the archaeology for it has already disappeared. Or if we're really, really lucky, it might be under the football field just to the west, but I don't think they're going to let us go back and dig up the football field. The other interesting things that we found about the, the Roman period was there was a strange number of horse skulls and horse burials going on. There's also a lot of wells on the site. And then um, everything seems to tail off as we get closer and closer to the fourth century. So we have high points of Roman occupation through the first and second century, carrying on from the, the Iron Age settlement. And then everything tails off into the fourth century. And the fourth century remains that we have our only burial deposits. So wells, we had several wells across the plateau area, in, which is the large area again, area two, right on top of the plateau. We don't think they were all in use simultaneously. They could be older than Roman, but the deposits in them all contained Roman material. This one was the deepest one we came across. So we have a one meter scale here and it's another meter down there. We had to get the machine to come into a half section this for us again once we got halfway down so that we could get to the bottom of it. This one was pretty much one fill all the way to the top. So this gray material continued all the way up indicating that this is a very deliberate backfill. So whether the Romans opened the well or not, it was definitely Roman period that they were sealed. But there were several across the site. So they probably sunk one over here, used it till it's run dry and then moved over here, sunk another one, used it till it's run dry and continued this way. It's consistent with a, an agricult agricultural rural villa site to sink your well, move on, move on. Again, what was weird about the wells is that we had horse skulls found in the top of several of them. One of them had two horse skulls in it. We're not sure why these horse skulls were there. There were a lot of them. So here we go. There's one in a dedicated pit here, just a horse skull and one leg. There's two horse skulls in one of the wells here. And this one is our complete skeleton. We had two complete burials, although one of them was missing the head. So it wasn't quite complete. This one was our more interesting one because we have the horse here as his head, neck, back. Legs are tucked up underneath, so sort of pulled right in. But we have three other animals buried with this horse as well. There's one little dog. We think they're dogs. They're either dogs or cats. Dogs would be the more logical, <laughs> the more logical animal for it to be. There's one down here. There's one just down there and another one just over here behind the horse's head. Uh, we're not sure why they're there. There is an example of a burial pit, I think it's in London, where there is a horse, dog and a deer buried, which is supposed to be some kind of ritual hunting burial so that they can hunt through eternity. We don't have a deer in this one, but it could be that we're looking at something similar. So a horse and hunting dogs have been buried together. The thing that really confuses us about it is that horses in general tended to be a valuable commodity throughout the prehistoric and, and Roman worlds. It's, it's not a creature that you'd sacrifice easily. So we, we can't see why the heads are here unless there was something very strange going on. We've wondered about a cult of Apona. Apona is um, usually regarded as a fertility goddess. She began life, I think, as one of the Britain Celtic gods and was absorbed into the Roman, Roman pantheon. She's often shown as a horse or with a horse, but I don't know of any, um, any sacrifices to upon her that required the decapitation of a horse or the burial of horses' heads. We've wondered as well whether this could perhaps be a Roman horse stud. Perhaps somebody living there thought this is a lucrative career. The Roman army are only down the road. Maybe they need horses. And perhaps what we have is a horse stud. It may explain the reason for burials if these were favoured animals, but it still doesn't sufficiently explain why we have horses' heads on the site. We wondered, could it be a festival of the October horse? This was one that I read about somewhere and I'd never heard before. Apparently, um, retired veterans could celebrate the October horse by killing the, the lead chariot horse of a chariot pair. It seems a very expensive and strange thing to do, especially if you're out in the wilderness somewhere. So we're not sure that that's the reason for it either. Our only other option is perhaps that this was a raid 
and raiders came in, killed the horses, threw the skulls in the wells, perhaps to contaminate the wells. Wouldn't explain why one was buried in a pit, nor would it explain the two horse burials. And again, horses seem to be very, very valuable as a commodity. It seemed more likely that if you were raiding, you'd want to steal the horse and take it away rather than kill it. So we're going to look into more sites around the Oxfordshire region again, see if we can find anything comparable, certainly of Roman date, to match up with these. Late Roman period is very, very limited in nature. So everything that I've previously talked about for the Roman period is first to third century. Late Roman is very limited. The occupation of the site seems to have ceased completely, which is another reason we were wondering about raids being caused for the horses' skulls. The only confirmed activity we have in the fourth century is burial deposits. We have five fourth century burials. Two of them are rather strange. Three of them were oriented east-west and were in very, very terribly fragmented condition. They were in areas of boggy ground and they had not survived well at all, but we got a good solid fourth century radiocarbon date from them. Two of them were oriented north-south and were a little bit different. And we, we think that this is the abandonment of the site. It's possible that the two skeletons that were a little bit different may be associated with a raid if there was a raid. They may be the unfortunate owners of the rural villa. So a warning again for those of you who didn't want to look at the skeletons. My next slide does show the skeletons. So these are our two strange burials that we had buried north-south. We don't think we had a graveyard in the fourth century. The burials that we have are scattered across the site. There's nothing organized about it except for these two, which are so close together and lined up so well, they must surely have been buried as a single event. The manner of these two is very strange though. They don't look like they've been buried with a particular degree of respect. This one has his arm trapped underneath him here. It's underneath the pelvis with another arm rolled over and his head kind of looks to me like he's pointing in the wrong direction as if he's been rolled from the side into the grave. Again, decomposition can cause some shift in bones, but that's certainly what it looks like to me, is like he's been rolled in. This one is obviously lying on his front. This arm is pressed up against the side of the grave cut here, as is this one, it's sort of leaning out at this angle. And the feet are very, very squashed in. Like we had with the Iron Age burial, these grave cuts are a little too small for the, the burials contained within them. So we've been wondering whether these are criminal executions, which would account for perhaps the lack of respect in the interment, or whether it is a raid and these were the unfortunate owners of the, the Roman rural villa. Or again, are they simply a fast burial into frozen ground while people are passing through? These are answers that we're never really going to be able to find. There were no grave goods contained within the graves. It was just the skeletons that have given us the radiocarbon date. We're not unfortunately going to be able to say much more about them, we don't think, unless we can find any other pairing that we can compare it to elsewhere. So away from the Roman period, everything really does seem to tail off in the fourth century. Our only indication of Saxon use of the site is a single fourth, not fourth, fifth, sixth century burial. It's another east-west oriented inhumation, but this was in very, very poor condition. Unless the sunken featured building that I showed you earlier that we thought was Iron Age turns out to be Saxon when we reanalyzed the pottery, there is no evidence whatsoever for Saxon occupation of the site. So it seems likely that the site remained open as rural land. The medieval period was represented by Ridge and Furrow and this ditch down here. So again, the plateau is the plateau is up here. This was our area too, the really large area. The hedge came through here and this is on the slopes down towards the south. We had a substantial medieval ditch here, but it didn't seem to continue anywhere further up. So perhaps this hedge boundary is an old hedge boundary. Ridge and furrow we'd seen previously on aerial across softly east-west all the way through area two, some north ridge and furrow down at the bottom end here, following the slope. Other than that, we saw no real evidence of medieval um, occupation or use of the site at all. We had no medieval pottery, except for the few sherds that came out of this ditch, and there were only four or five of those. Post-medieval activity, we had nothing whatsoever. There was absolutely no indication of 16th, 17th, 18th century activity at all. The only modern things that we had on the site were the modern drains that had been put in for modern agricultural processes. So everything really seemed to grind to a halt at Milton Heights in the early fourth century. What we do have, however, is a mass of undated features. So for all of the features that I've shown you, we have this many undated features. 
The problem that we had with Milton Heights is that there's simply been so much go on on the site, including the later ridge and furrow medieval agriculture, that we found pottery of all dates in almost all features. So these huge ditches that are coming through here, looking at the profiles of them, they look very much like big substantial Iron Age boundary ditches. Unfortunately, they're stuffed full of early Iron Age and Middle Roman pottery, and we can't tell what's intrusive and what is residual. So we're trying as best as we can to pick apart the stratigraphic sequence, seeing where ditches intercut with each other, and then looking at the spatial data to see whether we can start matching up ditch alignments and forming enclosures from them so that we can say, even if we have pottery of all dates from one of the ditches, we may be able to assign it to a different period based on where it fits in the stratigraphic sequence. It's uh, rather unfortunate that we had so much pottery, really, because there's just so much of it we can't separate things. If I show you this slide, this is again our, our picture of the plateau up here. So there's my large area two up there with these. This substantial ditch here is actually this undated one curving down there. You can see the Roman ones just on this side here. That's those ones. And the big medieval one is running just down here in this one. So you can see we have managed to date quite a lot of the site. Everything that's coloured in is a dated one. All the grey ones are the undated features. We have our Bronze Age over here. We have the medieval through the middle. Medieval Iron Age, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Iron Age through the middle here up on the plateau. The later Iron Age, early Roman continuing on the plateau and Roman all shifting off to the west over here with just medieval down at the bottom. This was our really early ditch where we had the one, two sherds of Bronze Age pottery and the early Iron Age pottery. This is where we thought the earliest use of the site might be, which is right down at the bottom of the hill. It's just off the photograph here, just down there. But there's nothing else around it that we can see. All the other early Iron Age pits and post holes were up here. We're thinking at the moment that these up and down ditches may relate to the Roman ones. They seem to run parallel. We're thinking spatial data and stratigraphic analysis might give us that one. This one's a little harder to work out. Looking at the colour coding on here, it may link with the later Iron Age, early Roman orange ditch here that went around this um, complex of ring ditches. Or it could be that this was the huge boundary ditch to the original Middle Iron Age settlement, in which case it perhaps should be coloured green and sit with, um, with the Iron Age landscape. We're simply not sure at the moment. We're continuing to look into all our records and all our archives. Fortunately, Red Row are continuing to fund us for the moment so that we can look into it. So we've got a lot of work still ahead of us for Milton Heights. Although we've managed to, um, we have managed to give you a roughly, a rough overview of what was going on from the Bronze Age through to the medieval period. Um, this pretty much brings me to the end of what I was going to tell you about, actually. So if I move on, um, you can keep up with, uh, with MOLA. They're on, our, they're on our website. We have a blog that we update very regularly with what's going on, any new finds that we have, new publications coming out. We're very active on Facebook and Twitter and on LinkedIn. And if you'd rather just keep up with me and look at what I, I have my own website where I detail what it's like to be a commercial archaeologist ranging from everything from working in frosty, frozen, cold weather to what to do when you machine through a water pipe at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. The key answer to that is don't panic. I'm on Twitter and Facebook as well. And if you are interested in reading any of my, my fiction, it's available on Amazon. I currently have two books out with me. So that is my very quick run through of our Milton Heights site. And um, if I stop sharing my screen there, I'm quite happy to, uh, to answer questions. I appreciate that might have been a very, very rapid